Good evening. I'm Jim Zirin, and you are watching The Digital Age. With us is Peter Georgescu. Peter Georgescu has written a blockbuster book, blockbuster book called The Constant Choice. The Constant Choice is about his half-century life's journey from refugee when he came to America in the 1950s to CEO of one of America's largest advertising firms. In addition, he draws some important conclusions about choices uh, that we are to make in our daily lives between good and evil. Peter will also tell you about how he has been marketing the book. He's been marketing the book using digital technology. Peter, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you very much, Jim. Good evening. We usually shake hands at the end, but I'm happy to shake let's, hands let's at the beginning. Let's start the right way. Let's start yes. the right way. Now, let me ask you this. How did you come to write this book? Why did you write it? And tell us what you say in it. Oh, that's all, huh? <laughs> that's all. Uh, well, I, I may interrupt you. Please, please. <laughs> you know, I wrote this book because for, as you mentioned, about 50, 60 years, I've been obsessed with the question of why do we do some terrible things that we do unto one another? Uh, why do we lie? Why do we cheat? Why do we do harm? onto other people. And by the way, that's the definition of evil. I checked it on my iPhone. It says doing harm onto other people is evil. That's holy writ if it's on the <laughs> iPhone. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so legitimate. I add it without fair and reasonable justification. But I have been obsessed with this question. And the timing is right. In all my years in this country, I have never seen such extraordinary difficulties in getting things done, in worrying about the common good, in, in worrying or believing that common sense can guide us somewhere. We live in a world of tribalism, of contention, of, of amazing distortions and deceptions. All we had to do is to go back and remember the primaries a year or so ago, or the general elections. I mean, it's outrageous. You know, for thousands, for hundreds of years in politics and religion, people used to have these tactics. And so I'm raising the question to the readers and the viewers, why is it that we choose to accept part of us, the part of us that is really capable of doing evil, whether it's in business, the greed, the, the recklessness, the narcissism that brought around the 2008 recession, for example. Millions of people were put out of work. Millions still are hurting today. That's evil stuff. It's being done. The lying and cheating in schools, the political, I mean, we are becoming a banana republic that we used to deride because few big dollars are beginning to own our politics in Washington with selfish interests. So that's why the, the, the constant choice was written today, basically saying, let's understand where this evil comes from. And once we understand that, let's say, enough already. We don't have to do this. We have a choice, because we are also good people. You know, I was just so stunned at the reaction in this city, in this state, in Connecticut, in New Jersey, after Sandy. The hurricane. The Hurricane Sandy, just a few months ago, where thousands upon thousands of people rushed out to help. They sent clothing because it was cold. They sent food because there was none. People were taken in because there was no shelter. By the thousands. So in us, there's this clear propensity to do good for kindness for well, and evil as well caring. because there was looting and uh, there and was all, all sorts of other uh, evil acts that uh, people uh, uh, perform toward each other that's exactly the point so obviously somewhere along the the line somebody made choices and that's what the book is about well let's go back to the beginning uh, which were your early encounters with uh, evil in uh, communist Romania uh, why don't you tell us the story of uh, how it all started? Well, it all started in Romania, of course, as the communists took over. And uh, they, my parents were stuck in the U.S. They came on a business trip. My father worked for Esso, 
That and was in 1947. Exactly, in 1947, just when the Iron Curtain came down, and the Iron Curtain was properly named because it said, in essence, you couldn't get in and out of the Soviet republics or Eastern Europe without the approval of the communist governments. So nobody got out who wanted to get out or could get in. So you and your brother were there, and, and my your mother parents were in New York with, uh, um, when you, where your father was doing business with Esso, now Exxon. Exactly, and had my father uh, tried to return to Romania, he would have been killed because they rounded up some close to 300,000 political leaders, business leaders, religious leaders, intellectuals, anybody who could be a threat to the communist regime was rounded up and annihilated, destroyed, killed. Now As was my grandfather, by the way. Yes, and uh, he was a great Romanian patriot, wasn't he? He was, he was a highly respected man, almost eight years old, made no difference. They picked him up and they took him up to a prison close to the Ukraine border and then uh, they forced him to clean his cell one day and the guard kicked him in the face until he died. Horrible story. And now, at the time that your parents left, you were staying with your grandparents, were you not? You and your older brother? Yes, they were actually, they were babysitting for us in, uh, in Bucharest, our home, and then we went with my grandparents back to Transylvania where he had been governor and before he got arrested. And then they arrested us too. Shortly after they took my grandfather away, they arrested my older brother and my grandmother. We were taken to the eastern part of Romania, close to the Russian border, and that's when they put us into hard labor where we were for a bunch of years. Well, it was about seven or eight years that you uh, didn't see your parents, isn't that right? Yeah, exactly, it was about seven and a half years from 47 through the end of, uh, uh, through part of 54, yes, correct. And. Uh, Tell us a little bit about the conditions under which you lived when you were uh, in Romania. Well, As during a the child of uh, of what? Uh, well, seven I, or eight. Yeah, I was about uh, eight, eight and a half, or something like that. You know, I don't even remember exactly my when when the arrest took place, but it was something like that. And we were in hard labor. We had one room. There were no furnishings in the room. There was a bunch of hay. That was our bed and a bunch of blankets. So that was home and uh, we would go to work in the dark because we were there before six o'clock in the morning. And in the early years, I f was able to fit in the sewers of uh, the town of Borosan. And uh, I remember myself, it, it was cold and damp and miserable and the stench was horrific. In fact, it was embedded in my sinuses for months and months after I left the sewers. But carrying buckets full of sludge to the openings was, was, was hard, literally hard work. Six days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day, and Sundays we slept. So that was, and then I, afterwards when I got a little bit bigger, taller, I was able to now dig holes for electric poles in the, around the city of Botoshan. So it was hard labor. And you were almost electrocuted at one point. I had to pull the, uh, turn off the lights about five o'clock in the morning that was part of my chores. And I got close to the humming transformer that you knew where it was because it was dark and the, the lights were dim in the city about every quarter of a mile or so. And I had to get close to the transformer, make sure that I put my hand on the wooden handle of the switch. If I touch the metal, I'll be thrown back because there were over 300 volts of electricity going through very rudimentary stuff, and I would find myself on the ground. Uh, not that infrequently, as a matter of fact. But I learned, I learned. So <laughs> a horrific childhood. Well, that was a different kind of education that most kids around the world have. Now, you weren't being educated formally at this time, were you? Zero, no, I worked 12, 12 hours a day, six days a week. Sundays was lights out sleeping. And uh, you spoke Romanian, of course, you spoke no English. So I was lucky when I got here uh, to the States um, to, uh, to have a lot of guardian angels to help me. Well, you came to the United States in 1954? Yes. And uh, describe how that happened. Well, very briefly, um, the story is that the communists went to my parents and said, Mr. Georgescu, if you want to see your kids alive again, you're going to spy for us. And my 
dad uh, went to the FBI, and eventually they concocted an extraordinary scheme. They said, go to the press and tell them that American citizens, because they had become American citizens, knowing they could never return to Romania again, to communist Romania. And uh, so they said, Mr. Georgescu, tell the world that American citizens are being blackmailed with the lives of uh, their children, of your children. And create a scandal, and maybe the Russians who wanted to have a kind of a clean PR act, and they didn't want to act like the evil empire that uh, were named later mm -hmm. on. Uh, so maybe the Russians would tell the Romanians not to kill the kids in, uh, and appear vengeful. So my parents chose principle and integrity, and they put their own fate and our lives in the hands of the people of the world. And it was an um, amazing story on every newspaper around in television and radio. And this extraordinary woman, Frances Payne Bolton. She's one of the guardian angels. You she write about is the book. Uh, right up there at the top of the list with my grandmother and my parents. And she read the story and said to uh, my father, called him up and said, Mr. George Esco, I'll get the boys out. And uh, eventually she did. And the way she did it, she went eventually to Dwight Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, and said, Mr. President, get the boys out. And I don't know what he said. I presume he said, yes, ma'am, and saluted, because mm -hmm. Frances Bolton was a force. She was a uh, chairperson of the Foreign Relations Committee in Congress. And you can imagine a woman in those days uh, achieving this uh, station. She also was the, one of the richest women in the world at the time. And I met her later on, and I can tell you, if that lady ever walked into a room, she could part the seas, <laughs> pardon the mixed metaphor. <laughs> she was a real force. And anyway, we, we got traded for a, presumably a bunch of uh, spies. We don't know who they were because to this they, day, to this day, because the CIA didn't keep uh, records, specific records in those days. So you came over, and you were reunited with your parents, and then of course it was front page news here in the United States. I mean, what a dramatic story that you and your brother uh, released from captivity, and both teenagers. Yeah. And uh, so tell what happened then. Well, as a matter of fact, I, I do have a, a you know, on my website. Uh, a little clip of my mother talking about our pending arrival to mm -hmm. the States, the excitement of this lady going to see the kids that it, she hadn't seen for close to eight years. But, you know, the rest of my life was pr kind of normal. The, the principal of Exeter Academy, another guardian angel. Well, wait, it, but uh, it wasn't all that normal. You came over and you met the Brooklyn Dodgers. You oh, met yes. Jackie Robinson. You were yeah, on Pee Wee Reese. Oh, Pee Wee yes. Reese, you were on the Today program. Uh, Ed Sullivan, yes, yes, yes. And Ed Sullivan. Yeah, it was my not, five not, minutes not, of... Not every teenager gets to do that, except <laughs> maybe the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we were right around the time of the Beatles coming on Ed Sullivan, but, uh, you know, it was our five minutes of fame that lasted a couple of weeks or so, and we were in every conceivable show you can name. But, but, but the real story was that, that this guy, the principal of Exeter, called my father and said, this boy who doesn't speak a word of English, or didn't when he arrived, hadn't gone to school for a bunch of years, I'm going to save a place for him at Exeter because he learned a lot of other things in his life. I met with him and he said to my dad, well look, if this, uh, uh, he said to me, if you can pass the courses on your own at the end of the first year without any consideration for your background, you get to stay, otherwise I'll find the right school for you. Of course, I had no clue what he was talking about. I said, yeah, it sounded good to me. And so I entered Exeter. I passed my first year. That's what I meant. And the rest, uh, I graduated from Exeter. I got a BA from Princeton and an MBA from Stanford. So your formal education really began at the beginning of high school and yes. what we call the ninth grade? Well, actually, actually not, because on the way to the, the car uh, with my father when I left William Soles, and so he asked me, what, uh, what class was the was headmaster, the, of, the headmaster of, of Exeter? Exeter. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, what, uh, what Another class? Another guardian angel. Yes, <laughs> for sure. And he said to me, what, um, what kind of class would you like to be in? Again, I didn't quite understand the implication of that. So the only thing I could think of, I, s I said, I want to be in the same class with kids my own age. So he looked at me, kind of shrugged his shoulders, and said, what difference does it make? You'll be a sophomore. <laughs> 
So I started Exeter as a sophomore. You started your formal education yes. as a sophomore in high school. But I did know my multiplication table. I did, know how to, I did not know how to divide. I remember that. I learned that at Exeter. But add and subtract, you were great I at it. I was great <laughs> at add and subtracting, and I remember my multiplication. Well, you don't need to know much more than that. So then That's you it. go from Exeter to Princeton? Yes. And you graduate from Princeton with honors, and you go to Stanford Business School? Yes. And, and then what happens to you? And then I, and then I entered uh, Young and Rubicam. So wait, you applied for a job at uh, Young and Rubicam and some guy came out to interview you. Tell us about oh that Oh my one. goodness. Oh, well, he, uh, actually I didn't want to interview him. Was the placement director who taught, told me to go see this guy simply because I already had a job from ESO International. And so he said, this guy's coming from New York we got to keep them coming. Only one person signed up. You're going to be interested. So I said, sure, fine. Uh, don't make it too early in the morning. And <laughs> it was in the spring of my second year. And uh, so I went to see him, and uh, he, uh, he asked me why I wanted to go into business. And I said, oh, I like people. People are important. I think I'm good with people. I like people. I care for people. I didn't know what else to say. Yeah. So sooner, what's bad? What bad? Yeah. So he whips up a ticket and puts it in my hand and says, uh, "Come to New York and see us." I had friends in New York. My parents had moved to London. There was no way I could afford to go to New York see my friends. So I said, "Sure, I'll be on the next plane." So I went to New York and spent a bunch of days, and I liked what this company was doing. The training program that this man told me about was three years in research to learn about the consumers, what they think, what they wanted. He said, we serve the consumer. That's our business. That's our real business. And then we create advertising to, to fulfill the needs of these consumers. But what you didn't know was that the interviewer was the head of the research department. Not a clue. And you said you wanted to go into the accounts management yes, department. Yes, because he gave me the option. He said, after three years, you can be a research professional or you can go in account management and be the quarterback of a bunch of team with creative people. And which, what would you do? And I said, well, because I like people and I care for people, mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to be in the account management department. So years later, when you become the CEO of Young and Rubicam, this guy had a retirement party, right? That's exactly and right. And he said to him, why in hell did you hire me? And what did he say? He <laughs> said, because I knew you went to all these good schools, <laughs> so you had to be decently smart but it was your character integrity. So I walked away from the man <laughs> for about 20 paces of hubris and arrogance <laughs> until I turned back and I said, by the way, his name was Peter also. I said, Peter, what made you think that I had these character integrity in 20 minutes or so of the interview? He said, you told the most important man in the research field in America that you'd rather <laughs> go into account management than research. And you hit your head and you said. <laughs> I said, thank you, sir. I walked away and of course I never told him that. I had no clue who he had been at that time. What a wonderful story. Yeah. Now, uh, I promised you that I would ask you about how you're marketing this book because you're doing it in the digital age and you mentioned your website. What is the web address of your website? You can get to the web address through the Constant Choice or through my name, Peter Georgescu. I've got and to put you in Google and then I'll find you. You put, put me through Google and you'll find me. Okay, so how do you market a book in, in well, this I'll, day and age? <laughs> I wanted to, this is a great question because my first book came out about five years ago, The Source of Success. It's about the importance of creativities and values in business. And, and so I marketed the traditional ways with newspaper interviews and radio interviews and television and that was it. In today's world, the world has changed. It is, uh, I don't know, 80% digital media. If you, if you don't market through the digital world today, you don't get anywhere. And so I use just about every conceivable tool. I'm not the techiest person in the world, but the digital world is an essential part of the business today. You know, as a matter of fact, I'll go as far as saying that your program would have to be invented if it wasn't already here, Jim. <laughs> so God bless you, well, you know. You're ahead of your time because today. Thank you very much, I always thought so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right, you're right. Uh, because, you know, it, everything starts with a website. You have to have a, a decent website uh, to start with. And then, you know, I put together uh, a list of all my friends, acquaintances, biz business relationship, and we had over uh, 1,500, 1,800 email blasts that got us started. I also started before the book came out uh, to blog. So we started writing blogs. 
And th the theme of the blogs have to do with good and evil, celebrating the good things that are happening around us, uh, the writing and pointing out the evil that's going on. And in addition to that, you know, you have to go on Twitter. And so tweets are the other part of it. I have a Facebook, business Facebook part of it. It's all integrated and it's working. It's working, I'm building slowly, uh, building followers, building people interested in the topic. And uh, so the sales are beginning to happen. There's also an economic component, isn't there? Because it costs a lot of money to take a full page ad in uh, the New York Times Book Review, but, or the New York Review of Books, but here you can reach many more people and you can even find out who is responding. Yes, indeed you can, and, and it's, it's, in fact, it's not affordable for, for a normal person. The, let, let's understand, in the publishing business, the publisher gets you the book, they help you out, and unless your name was Clinton or, or some celebrity or the Pope, you're not going to get the publishing industry to support your book. That's you, what you do you yourself. Or you slept with Kennedy. Then or you slept with Kennedy. My favorite. I, I had a problem <laughs> in my life doing that. <laughs> So, you know, you have to do it on your own, and it's not affordable to buy advertising. You know, you have to rely on PR. And look, what does the digital world really mean in many ways? It's the new version of the word of mouth. This, this is what I learned in advertising. Word of mouth is the most powerful media ever created by men. And the, the point is to kindle that spirit, that force, in the digital world, it means going viral. That's what it is, the word of mouth in a digital world. And it's powerful stuff. And, and, and you, have to, you have to use every tool available to you, every digital tool, and that's what brings success in the market in, in, in the digital age. So what themes do you emphasize on, uh, on your website and in, uh, in these email blasts? I mean, you're telling them, I mean, you've really, in, in many ways, you've written two books, one about your background and your marvelous story and your miraculous deliverance from uh, the communists in Romania, and then the second is uh, the, the conclusions you draw from your yeah. life's experiences. Well, I exactly, that's exactly right, and it is one book I'm ex basically, I'm exploiting my own story so I can tell people where this evil comes from. Well, exploiting in the best sense of the word. I uh, take advantage of, mm -hmm. <laughs> in the best sense of the word, exactly right. And I also talk about the fact that our evil side comes from seven million years of living uh, as bipedal humans or what became humans in the African plains with predators and for those predators, we were the da their daily meal. And so we learned to be ruthless and v uh, violent and deceitful, everything that it took to survive. And we had to endure winters well, with no food. Well, imposed this on us as survival of the fittest. So. It, it was indeed. And we're talking about seven million years. So when I think of the original sin, I no longer think about Eve biting on the apple. I think about these poor people spending seven million years of encoding in our DNA. And evolution happens slowly. So those instincts are in us. And that's why we do some of the things that we do. We hoard food or we hoard goods because it was useful at one time to do that. We're, we're mean and nasty and violent because it was useful to do that. And now we don't need that. It's a handicap. It's no longer natural. It's destructive. So the good news is that we have a choice. We can choose to understand our instincts and say, I'm not going to do that because we also have this good side of us, and it's fantastic. And so the choice for us as humans today is to move the human condition more towards the good. And that's the fundament fundamental message that I want to put across through every medium known to mankind. Thank you, Digital Age, for helping me do this. Well, this is not something that you came upon recently, is it? I mean, this is, uh, you were kind of informed by this uh, throughout your uh, professional life. I mean, you were involved with spiritualism and uh, uh, with uh, uh, various people, or maybe other guardian angels, who uh, inspired you along the way. Isn't that right? Completely so. Completely so. Because if you think about just yourself, uh, you're not going to be a happy person. Uh, happiness, joy in life, and for that matter, success in life, 
means having some, some the other, as I call it, the other important in your life, whether it's your spouse or your kid or your family or your community, that's what really matters in life. And you know, speaking about something spiritual, let me talk about science for one second and talk about the magic new science of epigenetics. And epigenetics says in simplistic form. Well, what is form, epigenetics? Well, it is a new science, and these ep epigenes sit on top of your DNA in essence. This is, I'm describing it at a very high level, but basically sit on top of your, uh, your uh, DNA, and they inform your body how to behave. And they go around your basic instincts. And if you behave in a certain pattern, let's say you're a good person, you behave in a good way, why over time you become literally, not just imagically or spiritually, you become physiologically a better person and you can also pass it along to your children. And so we no longer have an excuse to say we can't be better persons. We're stuck with what we are. Wrong. So morality makes good sense. Morality makes good sense. Well, this has been absolutely marvelous. And uh, Peter Georgescu, thank you for coming Jim, by. Jim, a delight. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. Well, it, uh, certainly worthwhile to, to listen to you and, and hear you uh, explain uh, the background of your book, which is uh, really a wonderful read, and I, I recommend it to everyone. And thank you for coming by. Uh, tune in next week for more on the digital age. Please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. For the Digital Age, I'm Jim Zirin. Good night and all the best.